Well, happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Crickets? Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome, Grace. Um, it is great to have all of you here. Uh, you know, I, I've heard Pastor Mike say this many times, but when you have a special Sunday, sometimes it's, it's the worst trying to figure out what, what the heck are you going to do on a special Sunday like this. It's Mother's Day, so... What do you do? And you, and you start feeling all of these different things, like it's got to be this, and it's got to be that, and it's got to be. And, and so I thought I'd go the easy route, and, and really, we're not going to have anything to do with Mother's Day. It, I'm just kidding. At the end of the service, we're going to take a moment and really recognize and celebrate moms. Um, but the message itself uh, is it's going to be focused a little differently. So turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Um, in, in Acts chapter 2, it, yeah, I want to ask you a question. And I'm going to ask you this question probably a couple times throughout the service, definitely again at the end of the service. But I want to ask you this question. Uh, what are you devoted to? What are you devoted to? What do you devote your time to, your energy to, your life to? What are you devoted to? You know, as I look around, uh, especially... For churchgoers, for Christians, for believers, for followers. There is a, there's a time where, for many of us, we, we, we got up out of our chairs and we walked forward and we responded to some form of an altar call. Uh, maybe it was the, with, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you want to give your life to Christ, just raise your hand. Or, or just stand up. Or even just look up. Or maybe for some of you, it was, it was in the privacy of your own home, reading your Bible, and you just came to that point where you just said, you know what, I, I just... Man, I want to follow you, Lord. I want to give my life to you. I surrender to you. And at that moment, making a change. And now for many of us, when we've done that, everything stayed right there. From that point on, nothing changed. We, we made this commitment. Uh, you're a follower of Christ. You give your heart to Him. But there's no change. There's nothing that has happened. There's no life change, if you will. And that's a little bit about what I want to talk about this morning. What are you devoted to? What takes up your time? What takes up your life? What is your focus? What are you devoted to? In Acts chapter 2, where we're going to get into some scripture, where we find it, for those of you that are, who aren't very familiar, uh, the book of Acts is right after the four Gospels. Jesus has died. He was crucified was in the tomb, he resurrected, he ascended. The day of Pentecost has happened where the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples in the upper room. And we find ourselves now in Acts chapter 2, and Peter has just wrapped up sharing his message with some people that were around him. And I'm just going to back up to Acts chapter 2, verse 40. And I'm going to start there. Again, he shared this message, and it says this, With many other words, he being Peter, warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So from Peter's message, about 3,000 became followers of the way, became followers of Jesus on that day. And then it goes on to say this in verse, verse 42. And this is a scripture we're going to stop and we're going to camp on today. It says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This idea of devotion, um, I, you know, sometimes when I see these words, I, I, I start to wonder, okay, so what does this mean? And so I looked up uh, in, in uh, Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Uh, and I know, as I look around, some of you were, were here when he wrote that. But it, it's a great resource for definitions. It really is, in all seriousness. So if you're ever wondering, uh, Google it. Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and you'll be able to search a word. Because here's the deal. These definitions still have biblical references in them. And it's really neat. It's Noah Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And so I looked up in this, in this dictionary. I put in the word devoted. And I got this, appropriated by a vow, committed to, solemnly set apart or dedicated to, 
consecrated. And when you look at those definitions, it's almost like you have the word devoted, and it's just kind of in black and white, you know, a little blurry. Great, but it's just the word. And then when you put all these words with that, it's like all of a sudden it's, it becomes color and it's in HD all of a sudden because it just becomes alive. And I want to ask you this question again. What are you devoted to? When you have those words that go along with the definition, what are you devoted to? What are you committed to? What do you have in your life that is set apart that is that important this idea of a vow. See, here's what I think of when I think of us giving our lives to Christ. What we do is we say, Jesus, I believe in you. I ask for forgiveness, repent of our sins, and have this desire to change our ways. And in doing so, we commit, we want to be a follower of yours. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. So by saying I'm a Christian, that means I am a follower of Christ. I am committed to to him. I am devoted to him. And I want to ask you this question. Um, and, and I want you to understand this. I, I know that today, I, I really do hope to challenge us today. I really do. I hope to lovingly step on some toes today. And that this would challenge us. Because with that being the definition, I wonder, what are you devoted to? If we've given our life to Christ, is it with that definition in mind? And since that day where you came forward here at the Four Slate campus or at another church or wherever, have you been devoted to following Christ? Because, friends, here's where that question comes from, is when I look at the state of our society, and I don't mean the church that's lost, because to be honest with you, we shouldn't be quite as frustrated as we find ourselves sometimes with the way people who don't follow Christ live their lives, right? Why do we expect them to live their lives differently when, when they don't have the moral compass that we do? Where I think we have a problem is, is in the church. We who profess to be followers of Jesus yet live no differently. We who claim to say, I want to follow you. We who say, Jesus, you're my Savior. We who say, I'm going to commit my life to you. But then in the everyday living out of our lives, it's no different than those who have no idea who Jesus is. And that, to me, is where the problem lies. And so when I start putting the pieces of the puzzle together, in my simple little mind, I think, okay, we have a breakdown here. What are we devoted to in our life? Not what does it look like on Sunday morning, not how pretty can our hair look or how nice are our shoes polished or what does our life look like? What are we devoted to on Monday morning? And that's what I want to look at. This is four quick points and then I have just kind of a, a silly little illustration that I want to do before we, we talk to the moms. But I want to look at these four points that this one verse so clearly points out. The early church... 2,000 years ago, they devoted themselves to these four things. I want to challenge us to do the same. The first is this, as the Bible says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Friends, you know, whether we like to admit it or not, we live in a world where we are living out 2 Timothy 4.13, I believe it is. 2 Timothy 4.13, it's the Apostle Paul, he's talking to Timothy, and what he's talking about is how in the last days, people will, will become pleasures, of, they'll want to pleasure themselves. It's all about me. And it says they'll go, they'll want to listen to, the message that they want to seek out is whatever their itching ears want to hear. Which means they'll go to find the message that matches with the lifestyle they want to live instead of desiring to have a lifestyle that matches the message that I believe in. Does that statement make sense? Instead of, I'll say it again, instead of looking for a, a, a lifestyle that fits the message, we go out and we try and find a message that matches the lifestyle. That's the satisfying whatever my itching ears want to hear. I want to do this, so I'm going to find somebody that says this is how I should live and I'm going to be fine with it. Instead of devoting ourselves to the teaching devoting ourselves, even if it means that our toes get stepped on a little bit, even if it means we get offended. Let me ask you this. When was the last time that you were in church and you stayed at the church where you were offended 
Because of the scriptures. Where because somebody preached that the Bible says, hey, maybe you shouldn't do that. Hey, maybe that's not a godly lifestyle. And instead of getting all undies bunched up and leaving, you said, you know what? That's true. That's the truth. And because I'm devoted to the apostles' teaching, because I'm devoted to living based on the scriptures, I'm going to listen to that and I'm going to allow myself to be corrected by that. Why? Because I am devoted to the teaching. I'm devoted to living my life the way this book says I should. I'm devoted to it. And I'll be honest, within the churches, even ours, when that kind of stuff happens, a lot of times people just get offended by it and say, well, who are you to tell me that I shouldn't do this or this or this? Now, I'm nobody to tell you that. But if it's what the Scripture says and, and you agree with it and believe in it, then, then we do something with it. Amen? We agree on that, but when was the last time that we allowed ourselves to be corrected? You know, the Proverbs talks a lot about correction heeding the discipline of the Lord, that God, God disciplines those that He loves, His children. The Father disciplines the children that He loves. But instead, we walk out the doors and we think, yeah, that's not for me. And we go about our way, being devoted to the apostles' teaching. The second thing, moving on just quickly here so that we can get to the moms, is they were devoted to the fellowship. And again, this is another one of those words that I looked up. And I looked it up in my concordance, and I looked up fellowship, and what it actually said was uh, it talked about intimate relationships. It talked about having close relationships. So having a relationship where you allow somebody into your life where they are going to be able to speak into your life. And if they have a, a, a word even of encouragement or correction for you, to not be the guy that knows everything, that has it all together, but to be the person, the man or the woman the older person, younger person, wherever you're at in the spectrum, that's able to humble themselves, be filled with humility and say, you know what, you might be right. Maybe I do need to do this. But again, in our world, we find ourselves so secluded, it's like we have these eight-foot-tall privacy fences around our lives, and we don't want anybody in there. I don't want my father-in-law to know what really goes on in my house. I don't want Jenny to, to see who I really am. I don't want Bob to know the struggles I really have. And so we put up these walls and we continue down this road that leads to destruction instead of doing what the apostles devoted themselves to. This fellowship, this time of intimacy, this time of, of having people that know us, of allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and letting our guard down to say, hey, Tom, I'm, I'm struggling here. To be built up and to be encouraged. The deterioration of our society, the deterioration of the family unit. How much of that has to do with this, this, this isolation that we have going on? The third thing is this. We have, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and then to the breaking of bread. Gathering together, being together, just like this. Devoting themselves to it. As Bruce alluded to yesterday morning, there were 75 or 100 plus men in this place. Packed to the basement, and we listened to Dean Weiberg stand up here and, and share testimony. And I, and I was sitting over there, right around where Adam is sitting, and, and I was listening to him. Not from the standpoint of being a pastor, but from the standpoint of him sitting there as a young man. I'm younger than Dean. <laughs> but of sitting there with a, a young wife, with young children, and listening to this man talk about his life. And talk about his struggles. And I listen to him talk about how he's been married for 60 plus years now. Oh, wait, no, he said it felt like maybe. No, I'm just. He didn't do that at all. He sat there and he talked about how much he loved his wife, how beautiful his wife was. He talked about the different ways that the Lord has spoke to him. He talked about the challenges he's had in life. He talked about his childhood and he talked about his drinking. He, he goes down the list and he talks about all this stuff, all this real life stuff and how his faith has impacted that stuff. And I'm sitting there as a young man, and I'm thinking, I love that. That challenges me. That encourages me. That gives me hope, and that gives me guidance. That, that gives me something. I'm fed because of that. And without that taking the time to break the bread and to get together in that big group, we miss that. What are you devoted to? What do you give yourself to? What do, you, what do you give your time to? 
Because I sat here and I watched a room full of men of all ages, from like 10 years old up to probably 80 years old. And I watched them be encouraged by Dean's testimony. And I watched them be challenged. And, and I, again, they were devoted to these things. And friends, keep in mind, now this is 2,000 years ago, a group of guys, a group of believers that got together, and it, it had to work because here we are 2,000 years later and we're still talking about it. They did something right. I don't know, maybe we should pay attention. The fourth thing is this, they devoted themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. And, and I believe you read through the scriptures and you see the corporate prayer, you see the individual prayer, you see all kinds, but the important thing was it was an important part of their life. Go back to the color version of the word devoted. They were committed to it. It was important to them. Prayer wasn't the, the thing that got shoved to the side. Oh yeah, by the way, we should probably do this real quick. But if you look around, look at the family unit, look at even our government, look at what's going on in our state, our community. And I believe this, there's nothing more important than praying than lifting that up. I, I met a, um, an older gal on Wednesday morning when I went and I had coffee with Pastor Travis. And, and we're just visiting, and of course, Travis, he's, this, he's fit and he's all about exercise and stuff. So we're sitting there having coffee. I have this sausage, egg, McMuffin greasy thing, and I'm just content as can be with my coffee and my fatty breakfast. <laughs> he, he, he comes over and he watches me finish this, and he's like, so... Uh, Let's go for a walk. I'm like, are you kidding me? Of course we did. I'm like, yeah, whatever. So we go walk around Roseville where we were having coffee. And, and it was so great because we get in this little neighborhood area and, and, and we're walking along and I'm half blind and I didn't have my glasses on. And all of a sudden he stops and, and he looks up in a garage and, and there's this older lady and she's sitting on her floor cleaning out the underneath of her lawnmower. And, and she was like 84 years old. I'm thinking, man, I hope I can walk when I'm 84 years old. She's cleaning out her lawnmower. So we walked up, and we just started visiting with her and, and told her who we were and different things, and we just had this great conversation. And she says, you know what my motto has always been? Offer it up. She says, I'd just offer it up. My kids would come with struggles, and we'd talk, and, I, and then I'd say, you know what the most important thing is? You've got to offer it up. You just got to offer it up. And just like it was no big deal, she's just like, you just offer it up. And again, it's this opportunity to hear from somebody who has lived life and the importance of something simple but profound as prayer. Friends, be devoted to prayer. And again, I want to challenge you with that. If you don't have that as an everyday part of your life, and I'm not giving you the template it has to fit in, whatever it looks like for you, do you pray? And if not, man, I want to encourage you to start. It is ever so important. Um, what are you devoted to? There are so many different things in our life that take up our time, that take up our um, everything, our resources. Ooh, my bad. Uh, but there really are. I want to show you this picture. Now, those of you that are used to me, you know I love visuals. I love illustrations. Um, so it's how I learn and I just, I, I love it. So I, I, I want to show you this one here. Um, I think this is great. But this vase, vase, depending on your properness, to me it's a vase. This is your life. Are you who you want to be? All right, it's my favorite song. So. All right, so that's your vase. Yeah, we're going to shatter that. No, I'm just kidding. And these, grapefruit. Now these... And some of you have seen this illustration, this type of thing before, but go with me because I think it's a great visual. These grapefruit are, are the important things in your life. This is, for the sake of this illustration, this is your faith. This is your relationship with God. This, these are the important things. Your family. That's what these grapefruit are. They're, they're the important things. And boy, do they look good right about now, don't they? So th those are the grapefruit. Those are the important things. And again, I want you to be thinking about this. What are you devoted to? What, what is important in your life? And then we have golf balls and uh, clementines. They're about the same size, and it's what we had around the house. But these, then, these are some of the other... I could not have planned that any better. <laughs> Actually, I planned that. These are the other important things. In your life, your work, 
um, the, the, the things that matter, the things that are important. Um, that's what these other things are. So you can see now how it's starting to fill up. But, but here's what we do. And have you guys noticed this? I, I just think this is absolutely hilarious. It's almost like being busy, being like out of control busy, is something to be proud of these days. Do you know what I mean? Anybody else notice that? It's kind of like, even, even in conversation, um, you, if you listen to conversation, listen to what people talk about. They start talking about how crazy busy they are. And they continuously are trying to one-up one another. It's like, yeah, I worked 472,000 hours this month, changed the oil, built a house, and had three dogs. Yeah, well, I worked 900,000 uh, hours this month and built a car, built a boat, dug a lake, and brought the kids to the soccer. Next guy, yeah, I walked on the moon. It's, it's this constant idea that we got to one-up one another, and it's unfortunate that something like being out of control busy, which actually, when you look at it, brings an amazing amount of destruction to our lives, is celebrated now. Do you know what I mean? People come up to me and it drives me up a wall because it's justification. If I forget to call somebody, if, I, if, I, if something gets pushed back, if something happens, you guys, it's, people are so fast to dismiss that. They're so fast to say, oh, that's okay, I know you're busy. That's okay, I know you're busy. It's all right, I know you're busy. We excuse so many things. Why? Because we're busy. And we continuously get busier and busier and busier. What are you devoted to? What sucks up all your time? This thing is full right now with the important things. But, but see, now we, we keep going. Now we add... I'm going to take this one out just for the sake of porridge. Now we start adding all the other things in life that come about. And we like to fill it up, don't we? And it gets messy. That's right, Jenny wasn't here for service. Last night when we were practicing this in my living room, the dogs were right there. They are just lopping these things up like crazy. But you can see how, look at it, how, how it's filling in. It was full. Now look at how full it's getting. And you know what we do? We keep going. We keep on and we keep on and we keep on. When was the last time you just had fun? I mean, you just had fun. I'll tell you, I'm challenged by this, this message, and it's, it always seems to work this way. It's like the things that I feel around my heart for you guys, it's like God turns around and slaps me. I'll tell you guys a story about being busy, and I want you to hear this, that I am not standing up here trying to say, I got it all together, okay? I don't. don't you? I, no, I don't. A week or so ago, my wife was at work, I, and, and I was getting ready to put my kids in, in bed. And I, and I like to, you know, go and, and snuggle with them and stuff once in a while. And we found ourselves up in the attic of our old house, with, and they wanted to play dominoes. And I'm thinking, all right, I got a lot of stuff to do. I mean, I, I just, there's stuff I want to get done. Melanie's not home. I mean, there's just stuff. And I'm thinking, all right, we'll play one quick game, get these guys off to bed, and then, we'll, uh, then I can get my stuff done. And the kids just wanted to play dominoes. And so I, I'm, I'm laying on the floor, and it's, it's almost like I felt God kind of backhand me right here in the bald spot. <laughs> and he was, it, was like, it was like in my spirit, and I didn't hear this audible voice or anything, but it was like in my spirit I just felt this, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me right now? You have nothing going on. It's 8.30 at night, and you can't lay here with your kids and play dominoes for a while? Are you kidding me? And I just felt this, oh, I'm so lame. And so I did. I, I laid there, and, and, I, and I played dominoes with them. And, you know, it was like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and they start yawning, and they're getting tired, and they go to bed. And I'm thinking, and I was trying to cut this as short as I could. Because, because of what? It's crazy. And I love my kids. I mean, I think I have a great relationship with my daughters. I love my wife. And in my head, I'm thinking, this is, this is ridiculous. It's lame. This thing is full. And this is our life, right? Just when we think it's full, we put more in and we put more in. And we're not done yet. 
Because this is all the good stuff. Now we keep adding the junk. It's like it's not full enough. Now we have more and more junk. This is full of sugar. And what a great picture of this it is. We start with grapefruit, something that's healthy, something that's good for us. But then we, we fill in every little nook and cranny possible with sugar, with stuff that's not good for us, with stuff that's not healthy. Like we have a spare, we got a spare 15 minutes, and, and what do we got to do? We got to find something to fill it with. And unfortunately, a lot of time, Really? <laughs> Unfortunately, look at how full this is getting now. Like a good cereal. <laughs> this is breakfast right here. But you guys, this is our, how many of us, this is our lives. And you know what, someone after first service came up and they're looking at this and they said, you know what? They said, you know what I hate is, this is my life so often. And I feel so much anxiety because of it that I almost dread somebody actually calling and asking me to help them with something because what am I going to do? This is my life. Every second of my life is filled with something. And what? I'm going to keep trying to add more and more and more. Look at that. That's such a great picture of life. And, and you know what? The reality is we're proud of that. It's like it's a trophy in a case that, that I, every second is busy. So this is one thing, but now here's where I think, this is what I think the reality is for us, is this. Whoops. That's life, right? That, that's this, this empty vase, this is our life. Now on this one over here, as packed and crazy as it is, we started with the good stuff. Here's the reality of what I think our lives really look like is we're full of this stuff. And we get so packed and so full of all of this stuff that's not good for us, that's not healthy, that's not godly, where now is there room for my family or my faith? There isn't any. Because my entire life, every second of it, is filled up with stuff that's unhealthy, that's unimportant, that doesn't matter. And friends, this to me is a picture of our world right now. It's a picture of society. It's a picture of the church. Second Thessalonians talks about people being busy bodies. They're just busy and they're constantly going and they're constantly moving. But what's getting done? The sake of the family, or the shape of the family, the shape of our world, the shape of the economy. I mean, you look at so many things, this is a mess. Friends, what I want to challenge you to think about today is what are you devoted to? What are you committed to? What do you give your life to? Because as many of us know, it is flying by. Amen? <coughs> Amen. I want to kind of step away from that a moment. And, and um, before we close, I know people got a lot of plans today, so we're going to dismiss on time. But I, I hope you guys contemplate that thought. I, I want to take a moment, and I really just want to recognize and, and thank moms for being moms. Um, and what I want to do is um, I really want to embarrass the heck out of all of you right now. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. All I'm going to simply do is, is this. We would like to, from Maranatha, um, we would love to give each of you a rose this morning, as we've done in years past. And uh, whether you're a guest or not, it doesn't matter. I, I would like all of the mothers to please um, not be so shy, but please come on up front here and just form a, a couple of rows. Um, we want to get a nice picture as well, too. But please, if you would, just take your time. Uh, make your way up here, all of the moms. Somebody's got to stand up and start walking up here because everybody's waiting for somebody. Thank you, Grace. Moms, please make your way up here. Um, everybody, young and old alike, please make your way up front here and stand right here in the center. That would be outstanding. How are you doing, Grace? It's good to see you. Good to see you. Yep. Go ahead and just get in line here and a couple people in the, the row behind here would be great. But come on up. Don't be shy. Just uh, make your way on up here. You want to go up and sure. 
Awesome. Beautiful. Can you get, get everybody in, those of you that are taking pictures? Do you want a little chair right up front there? No. Okay. Awesome. Let me get out of the way here because uh, <laughs> that doesn't make the pictures look very good. I, I want to actually ask Jim to come on up here. Uh, come on. And, and Jim is one of our board members for Maranatha uh, between both campuses. And what I want to do is um, I want to ask Jim to present each of you up here with a rose. And, and it's just a gift from Maranatha to you guys. Um, and to know this, you, you have raised children. Some of you have raised adult children. Some of you are still raising adult children. Here you go, Jim. You can just start handing those out. That'd be great. Um, and uh, some of you are raising grandchildren. Some of you have stepchildren. Some of you have adopted children. I mean, there's every kind of mom up here. And, and I just want to say thank you for that. Because uh, it, it's, it's something that we don't recognize you enough. But moms make such a difference, not only in the lives of children, but in the lives of so many people around them. And so as Miranatha, we just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you. And... Um, and just know that you're so appreciated and loved. Amen? Amen? Let's give them a round of applause, shall we? Absolutely. I think I'm going to give Jim a hand here. I'll start on this end, Jim. Here you go. What's that? There you go. There you go. Let me sneak right behind you here. There you go. A what? Oh, you do? There you go. Yes, ma'am. You got all of them, Jim? Reach behind you there. There you go. Wonderful. I think we got him, Jim. Awesome. Um, I'm going to get this stuff out of the way. If you guys can get some good, clear shots, that would be great. Um, thank you, Jim. Um, one thing, just so that you all know as well, if you would like a rose, if your mom's not here, or um, uh, if you want to uh, have one, uh, I'm going to give another one to Grace, actually. Um, just for, for the loss of your mom, just so that you have that, absolutely. Um, so if, if, if someone would like, uh, you can feel free to help yourself to them. They'll just be in the lobby after the service. But uh, again, ladies, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming up front so that we can just do this little thing for you. It's a small little thank you for everything that you do. If you all are comfortable, if you would just stand and um, just extend a hand out, we would just love to pray for these ladies that stand in front of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of these fine women. And Father, we do ask this, knowing that this day can be a struggle for so many. Father, we pray for comfort. We pray for encouragement on this day, for strength for every one of these women as they continue in their role as a mom or a grandma, a great grandma. Um, Father, there's so many different roles that these women fill. Father, I pray that you would uh, overflow them with your spirit, that you would watch over them, Strengthen them and keep them healthy. And Father, again, we thank you so much for each of them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Would you give them a hand as they go back to their seats? <laughs> go ahead, ladies. Go. And then if you all just want to remain standing, we'll just have a closing prayer once they all kind of get back to their areas. You know, friends, I, I hope on this day, even as we celebrate uh, Mother's Day, I, I, hope, I hope that you take this picture with you um, in that we don't just leave church and, and dismiss this, but if this is challenging to you, it is to me, then I pray that you leave and that you do something with it. Remember James 1.22, it says, Do not just be hearers of the word and so, you de so deceive yourselves. 
but do what it says. Friends, I hope that we can start to change this idea that being busy is some sort of a trophy. It's some sort of something to brag about. I, I like to be able to say, I just spent the afternoon with my family. I just went garage sailing all day with my wife. I love to be able to say that now. So friends, I hope that you, you balance that out, bring those things together, and that this is a picture that goes with you. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. God, just for, um, for your encouragement, for your word, and, and Father, just for your presence. And Lord, we give you the thanks and the praise for all that we have and all that we are. Father, I ask again just for your protection, for your guidance, uh, and Father, for comfort for so many that on this day will mourn. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.